Atheist Nomads, episode 113. Indian ex-Adventist and Black ex-Baptist with Jamila and Chris Randall. As a note, the conversation continues with bonus content available only for patrons. Find out more at patreon.com slash Atheist Nomads. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash Atheist Nomads. That's P A T R E O N.com forward slash Atheist Nomads. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-hahs. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. This is episode number 113. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hey there, hi there, ho there, neighbor. And joining us today are Chris and Jamila Randall. Chris is an aerospace engineer and Jamila is an author, speaker, activist, and actually an old friend of mine. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Atheist Nomads. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so it's been interesting. Uh, you know, a couple months ago, Jamila and I talked a, a bit um, catching up a bit since we went to high school and college together. And yes, this is the same high school where we <laughs> had uh, the apocalyptic survival school. So Jamila would have been right there with me. Uh, I think camped on the other side of the river, if I remember correctly. Yep. Girls and boys on opposite ends. Aww. <laughs> Split apart, just like they should be. <laughs> <laughs> um. So... And you both have very different backgrounds. Um, yes. So, Chris, let's start with you. Okay. Uh, what's what's your uh, your your basic background, uh, religious and otherwise, and uh, how did you get to where you are now? So yeah, I grew up. Uh, I grew up in the inner city, uh, South Side of Chicago, and I grew up in um, a uh, you know predominantly African American low income community. And my family um, uh, all uh, subscribed to Christianity in, uh, in some form. Uh, we, we were, I guess, officially, I was raised as a Baptist. And nice. so we, we, we attended a Baptist church, although I did attend Catholic school for, um, for a couple of years, early years, like uh, kindergarten and, and preschool. And then uh, once, I, once I started going to a public school, uh, we we pretty much attended Baptist church. So, I mean, if you know anything about the um, relationship between the African-American community or the black community and religion, it's that most most African-Americans tend to tend to be Christian. So um, or at least here in the United States. Uh, so. Uh, so, yeah, that's just uh, in a nutshell, you know, went to church. Uh, it was usually very long. <laughs> I uh, I always envied the few white people that I knew who went to church at eleven and were home by twelve fifteen. So, uh. oh man, for for my uh, church worship class in college, we went to uh, two black churches in Seattle. One was Adventist, and the other one was Baptist, uh, Southern Baptist to, to be more precise. And man, they started the actual church service proper at like ten thirty. Both of the churches. Mm-hmm. It wasn't done until like two thirty, and the potluck wasn't done until four or five. It's oh, an all day. On. It was all nuts. Day. Come on, I was I was raised Southern Baptist. We went to church four to six times a week, twice on Sundays. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> oh wow! Oh wow! 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 I had it much easier than uh, than Jamila, I think, when it comes to that, though. <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, Jamila, what's what's uh, your background? Well, um, about five generations, Seventh Day Adventist. Um, my family is from South India, and specifically, um, language group is Telugu. And so, I grew up with 
you know, in a, in a very small, uh, narrow bubble of Indians, specifically Telugu speaking Indians who were Seventh day Adventist and, um, missionaries, uh, from, I believe the U S and Europe, um, came to the village that my great great grandparents were living in and, uh, basically baptized everyone there. And I think it's been about, um, five generations. So, wow. uh, It's, it's deep in there. Um, I have to say the majority of my family, I can probably count on my hand um, how many people are not Adventist in my family. Um, oh, damn. Yeah. So, <laughs> wow. It's, it is a. Um, do, do you know what, approximately yeah. what year that would have been that the missionaries came over? You know, I wrote it in uh, Shameless Plug. My. <laughs> <laughs> My ebook called God, Love, and Indian Food, which is on Amazon. Um, and I wrote a little foreword in there that gives a little history. And I'm drawing a blank on the exact year. But um, uh, it's, I, I want to say it's over, uh, I want to say like 108 years ago or something. I think I did the math. And um, Okay, so right after great. 1900? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Wow, that's that's pretty early. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, um, I still have, um, a very close community of friends, family acquaintances that are, um, involved and affiliated with the Adventist church. And so that's still, um, an everyday part of my community and the people I know. And, um, of course my family, which is large. I have a big fat Indian family. <laughs> just like the uh, Greeks. So um, <laughs> it's it's extensive and it's, I mean, it is like, it, you can't separate it. It is it is ingrained deep. So um, about when did your family immigrate to the U.S.? 1985. Okay. And so I was a year and a half old and um, they came over with several other families that were um, Indian and Adventist and um they have basically built up a community here in the States all over. Um, and of course have kind of huddled around the various Adventist centers, which are around Adventist, um, main churches and main hospitals and universities. So they've kind of created their own subculture here, um, in America, which is where a lot of them have decided to settle and retire and, they they want to be around other Adventists like them, so that there's there's a big influx around those you know Loma Linda, California, Silver Spring, Maryland, Berrien Springs, Michigan. They're they're in those pockets. Okay, I'm kind of curious. How do you how do you and your family get along? Well, actually, um, my parents just left. Um, they came to visit from Oregon, mm-hmm. and we had a lovely five or six day visit. And I would say it's not, um, it's not tumultuous because it's really a non conversation. Nice. Yeah. So that's pretty much the stage we're at. We've had a few, um, a few awkward questioning moments about, are you going to church or not? But, um, (laughs) which is to be, uh, expected, but, um, you know, I've been kind of on my journey out of religion for about three, four years now. And so it's getting a little more, um, it, it's, it's feeling a little more natural just to be authentic about it now and, and not even uh, have to defend myself or worry about too much explaining. It's, it's just kind of like, nah, not going to church, but, no, you know, nice. you're welcome you- to and uh, we'll see you. We'll see you later. So hmm. it's. It, it it really has been pretty smooth for for the most part. You just kind of like uh, like this is a subject we don't need to talk about. Let's just be family. Yeah, we've found some common ground. We've still been able to go on vacations and enjoy each other, and um, you know, do the do the normal family stuff. Except, nice. um, you know, like I said, Adventism is so intertwined into my family's everyday life that it is hard to kind of separate it. So. Um, 
Uh, there's still a big elephant in the room. <laughs> it's kind of like Mormons. You never see a Mormon that's not smiling. It's kind of weird. <laughs> <A little creepy>. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and then, uh, Chris, how about your family? Uh, so my family, um, <clears throat> I have a pretty small family compared to, uh, compared to my wife, but most of them still reside in Chicago or, um, well, Chicago and Louisiana are the two uh, largest centers for my family. And, um, yeah, they are all um, still pretty hardcore. Well, I say hardcore Bible thumpers are hard, hardcore Christians. But um, if you know, you know, you know how Christians go, right? I mean, it, it they don't necessarily uh, practice what they preach all the time. So, <laughs> so. So, I mean, they're definitely all about going to church and, and, and they do a lot of praying, but um, they're not too um, evangelical with it, I guess you can say. So um, it, it only gets uh, challenging, I guess, for me during times of crisis. You know, um, I think we I think my family and I, some of my closer family members, we bumped heads a little bit a few years ago when my mom passed and mm-hmm. she um uh, she was diagnosed with cancer, and during that time, um, there was a, a heavy reliance on the church family, so to speak, and and prayer and things like that. And I, um, I didn't participate in that. You know, it was it, it just wasn't authentic for me. It did not. It, in fact, it felt the opposite of helpful. It felt uh, like we were, you know, providing or they were providing this false sense of hope for the, the dire situation that my mother was in at the time. And so I think that was probably the only time I've really bumped heads with my family regarding our difference in, uh, difference in beliefs. That's a really painful time too. Yeah. Yeah. It was a challenging, challenging time. All right. And Chris sticking with you, uh, how did you, what was your, your deconversion process like? Hmm. Hmm. That's a good one. Uh, you know, it was, let me see if I, I I don't know if I can put put an exact date on it. It, it happened gradually, but um, I guess if I had to describe what it was like, it was uh, I don't know. It was like uh, it was like slowly, slowly waking up from a bad dream or something. It was um, um, and, and you're trying to figure out, you know, you wake up and for those first few minutes, you're not really sure if you're still dreaming or if you're uh, if you're really fully awake and aware. Um, and then once you realize that you're aware, you have to start getting some clarity to your actions. And, you know, those first few steps out of the bed, you're trying to really be very intentional about where you place yourself. And so I guess that's what it felt like. It was it was fuzzy. Uh, you know, I remember I distinctly remember being a Christian and uh, and then I remember not being a Christian in that area in between. Was, was a little... <laughs> and oh, about how old were you when, when that process was going on? So I'd say it started roughly, uh, I don't know, roughly 12, 12 to 14 years ago. So I was probably in my early to mid 20s. I was I'm 37 now. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I know. Right. I just dated myself. on. on the internet here, but, uh, so, yeah, about 14, uh, 12, 14 years ago, somewhere around there is when it started. And, you know, it started with a lot of questions at the time. You know, I was studying engineering. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was really sharpening my analytical skills and my critical thinking skills. And the more I sharpened those skills, the more I uh, took you know philosophy courses and had discussions with uh, uh, intellectuals around various universities, um, the more I realized that um, I was being and I'll, I'll still still a phrase from one of my favorite authors, Sam Harris, I was being um intellectually dishonest with myself about my spiritual belief system yet i did not allow that in anything else that i uh that i did as far as anything else that i studied or believed in from an engineering perspective and so i had to question that like why is it that i can um go with little to actually you know no evidence uh, or bad evidence at best uh, about my spiritual beliefs that have huge implications for my life yet i require uh, testing and uh, evidence and analysis of that evidence for everything else in my life. And that's when it started to change. You know, I, I don't know. I can't say that I, I know you very well because, well, this is our first chat <laughs> here. But 
Yeah, you know, I, I'd say that's more on the strength of your character because uh, of being able to come out and question. I'm, I'm sure the philosophy class has helped a bit, maybe even a lot, but engineering is usually the safe bet for a lot of religious people because, you know, there's not a lot of introspection in a math class. True. So, But at the same time, when, you. with all the math that you're learning, you're learning lots of, of logic and, and critical thinking. And why would you use a lesser standard of evidence to base your life on than something you're building? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, that would seem to act. I would actually think that engineers would be the ones that would require the most cognitive dissonance to stay oh, religious. Goodness. I need to walk you through the shipyard. <laughs> 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 oh, I'm not doubting that there are religious engineers. I'm just saying it doesn't, doesn't seem right. <laughs> It doesn't seem right, but they're able to compartmentalize a lot more okay. versus uh, like a philosophy professor or something like that. I don't know, Chris. I put a lot of our shipyard welders up against your NASA welders, so. though. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we're we're in the South here. Uh, Bible Belt. And too, in the, in the Bible <laughs> Belt, man. And it's, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting to watch that, watch it, watch that, that dynamic play out. Um, sometimes when I, I hear some of the, uh, religious, uh, banter around work yet, I don't know, it's funny to watch them switch to, you know, talking purely about scientific evidence and how the data does, the data doesn't support a decision like this, Chris, and <laughs> 10 minutes later on the way to Bible study. So it's like, oh, <laughs> oh yeah, it's great. You know, I actually have a, a well, when I got hired into my office, it was a, a Mormon bishop as my boss. He had his direct underling doing security. Got an evangelical in the back office that has a foot and a half by four foot wide sign saying he has risen up on his wall of our <laughs> government office. Mm-hmm. Awesome. It's <laughs> lovely. <laughs> Wonderful. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We still um, up until, um, well, Actually, it's still it's still still happening in, in some areas. I mean, they still uh, pray before events in uh in our government f- facility as well. And I, f- I always found that quite interesting. Hmm. I actually was just on our local King Five News uh, a few days ago because we have a assistant football coach that prayed after all of the games with the players. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm. And yeah. He's actually a, a nuke engineer in the shipyard here. And, <laughs> wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com. Tweet us at atheistnomads. Send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads. Or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. Jamila, what was uh, your your deconversion process like? Well, um, you know, I I got uh, divorced about five years ago, and I was married to a um, Adventist. Uh, He was a pastor's son uh, from Seattle, uh, Wesley, and. during that time, it was it was uh, a freeing, I guess, of a lot of things in my life. Um, you know, a marriage, obviously, but then just um, allowing myself to kind of have the freedom to explore um, my thoughts, my beliefs, um, what I thought about basically everything, um, and. I had met Chris, who was not religious, um, when I met him. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of people say, well, Jamila, you married a non-Adventist, and that's that's why you're not, uh, you know, religious. That's why you're not Adventist anymore. And I hate to put that burden on Chris, but <laughs> <laughs> it was actually very um, important for me to be outside of the bubble and to be in a relationship that didn't require or just assume those things that I was, um, you know, taught as a child. And so um, being in a relationship with someone who was one, not Adventist, but also not religious, just allowed me the freedom to 
to explore without the judgment, without the self-judgment. And so um, I really, I, I think I got divorced and like I got an iPad the next week. And I feel like I just explored Google for the first time or something. But I got my <laughs> iPad and I remember like, you know what? I'm not going to church this Saturday. I'm going to just, you know, stay at home and chill. And I, I think I just went from website to website. I found like xadventist.com and all sorts of things about the church and other people who had very similar sentiments. And, you know, you feel so alone and then you go online and you search for something. You're like, oh, I'm not alone. There's thousands of people who feel the way I do. And I sort of just started finding solace um, online, um, actually, because I didn't really feel safe to share my thoughts, my doubts, my questions with people in my family or friends. And so I did a lot of just soul searching um, privately. And then um, Chris and I realized that we both really enjoyed the philosophical dis discussions. And I just felt safe for the first time to voice all my questions. Um, and I still have a million questions. And I'm finally okay with not knowing the answers. Um, but my deconversion probably started around the time I was 28, 27, 28. And um, I'm 31, about to be 32 next month. So um, last few years, and it's been, um, you know, a journey that's not over. And so I, I kind of am excited because there's, this is just the beginning of what I'm learning. And I'm, I'm very interested in mindfulness and self-awareness and emotional intelligence and all those things um, I'm exploring outside of just, okay, religion doesn't work for me anymore. But I'm also just learning a whole new concept, critical thinking, things that were just not um, introduced to me up till this point and that I've had to go seek out on my own and really enjoying um, filling my mind with new thoughts and knowledge and just allowing myself to learn things that may be taboo or um, in the Christian community, things that are just not acceptable. You know, I have I check out books or buy books that, you know, would would make my family and friends gasp. But, you know, it's <laughs> it, like not being not being afraid to read books. And, and honestly, that was something that I I had a fear of because um, in that small bubble, you know, there is a fear of learning things that are contradictory to what the church wants you to to believe. And so it's um it's not acceptable to just go to the library and check out books about other religions or non-religion. Um, I have the Atheist Manifesto <laughs> upstairs on my bedside table, and it's just, um, it's amazing to me. Like, you know, books are banned. They're, they're, there's a lot of things that are um, not acceptable, not okay. And so I just I just feel this freedom finally to to read what I want to and learn what I want to with, without repercussion. So I'm definitely at the, the beginning of a long journey. Awesome. I got, I got to ask one thing though. Sure. <clears throat> uh, and I'm totally not asking you to spill any dirt, but I've always seen preachers kids to be either on the straight and narrow or like real party people. Which one uh, was the X? Um, actually kind of middle of the road. I, I know mm. the stereotype and I've met, <laughs> I've met several. Um, um, my mom is a pastor's kid, you know. So um, the PKs, yeah. My, yep my my grandpa was a was a pastor. So, um, you know, I have to say they they come in all spectrums as well. So I, I didn't <laughs> I didn't have the total rebel. <laughs> so, um, but but uh, yeah, definitely was um, ingrained as a as a pastor's daughter in law. You know, you're. Mm -hmm. You definitely have there's some standards and and a shoes to fill so that was part you know part of my uh life for a while all right and in the comment you left on our alex jules interview you you mentioned mm -hmm. that there's a, a big difference between you know how you fit in with the the indian community 
as an atheist uh, versus how Chris fits in with the, the black community. Yeah. Um, could you two uh, elaborate on that a bit? Sure. Sure. Um, well, <clears throat> there's not a lot of room for atheists in the, in the black community uh, right now, so it seems. So I think typically what happens is if that conversation never arises, um, people just look at you with kind of shock and awe. And, um, <laughs> I had an experience recently um, where some some uh, associates of mine that I've known for several years just discovered that I was an atheist. Uh, this maybe was three weeks ago. And um, and we were having a conversation and we were sitting around a table. And and um, and so when the one of the the people uh, asked me about church and I said, oh, no, I don't, I don't go to church. I'm, I'm an atheist. Like everybody stopped. It was like, you know, the record scratched and and <laughs> and, um, and everybody stopped. And one guy uh, who was an old friend of mine, I've known probably six or seven years, said, well, I'll be damned. You learn something new about folks every day. How could you possibly be an atheist? <laughs> and um, and I said, well, what, do you, what do you mean? How could I possibly be an atheist? I said, I'm not I don't eat children or anything like that. I just don't believe the same thing that you do. And all of the questions came out about, well, what do you think happens uh, after you die? You know, I, I would respond with things like, well, why do you think something happens after you die in the first place? You know, like, you know, and it just it, it quickly escalated into somewhat of an aggressive conversation. And so, um, you know, we I just I just kind of dialed it back a little bit and left it, you know, kind of left it open ended like, hey, you know, Everybody has their choice, their choice to believe what you want to believe. And so it's it's just interesting, though, that it it I don't know very. In fact, I only know of a couple. Uh, one of them happens to be a family member of mine, uh, a couple of, of black folks that I have in my circles who who are atheists. And it's just not very common. Um, I mean, there's there are probably a couple of different, you know, um, theories as to why that is, you know, uh, it, it, if you look, I mean, the same reason when I look at uh, the missionaries who went over to India to uh, Jamila's family's uh, community there. I mean, I honestly and, and not to not to take a take a shot at, at Christians, but I mean, I think there is a correlation between um, um, poor, underdeveloped communities and the infiltration of religion. You know, I mean, you see it on the Christian side. You also see it. On the Muslim side, when you look at uh, what's going on in some of uh, some of the countries in the Middle East, where you find you know very poor, uneducated areas, and um, you have you know radicals of whatever religion that kind of move in and you know provide certain uh, certain things like you know food and education and um, mm -hmm. and, and healthcare, and then before you know it, you just grow this community that subscribes to that religion, and I think they tie tie it to the religion. And I honestly, I just feel like, um, I feel like the black community in some ways have been a victim of that, um, of that process as well of kind of manipulated in a, in a sense by, you know, religion infiltrating communities that needed, they needed support, that needed help, that needed, um, um, uh, access to certain things that they weren't getting access to. And, and the churches provided that. And, and before you know it, it was uh, it just became a part of the culture. That's yeah. Well, and, and the, yeah, the communities that have the least to give are the ones that are taken advantage the most. Yep. And using Adventists as an example, uh, you know, currently in the U.S., roughly one third of Adventists are white, one third are Hispanic, and one third are black. Hmm. That's <laughs> despite the fact that white people make up more than two thirds of the the national population. Hmm. Yeah. They're doing a lot better in minority typically poor uh, populations. And there's 1 million Adventists in North America. There's 18 million worldwide. And most of the rest are not in Europe or Australia. It's Latin America, Latin America, Africa, India, the South Pacific. Yep. Hmm. And aren't they, aren't they very underrepresented in the higher ups? Very, very, very. Yes. <laughs> Pretty much not represented in the higher ups. Well, I, yeah. I don't believe that's coincidence. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it, and it it almost seems like because like that that real missionary effort that was really starting up right when imperialism 
and slavery were both kind of drawing towards a close. Mm-hmm. Seems like an underhanded way to keep it going. Oh, I've always thought that wow. was a big way to keep people under control. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally, I totally agree. <laughs> Personally, like, um, you know, I didn't obviously grow up in India. I came over when I was a baby to the States, but um, just stories I've heard and um, experiences I've, I've uh, witnessed is, you know, uh, Adventists do have a, a strong health care focus, um, a strong education focus. And so um, in the areas where my family is from in India, they they have a hospital, they have schools. Um, and it is basically required that you attend um, one of the Adventist schools and then that you actually um, become employed by one of the Adventist um, church, um, biz, uh, you know, employers. So Ooh. whether it's working for the hospital, working for the university, um, working for the conference itself, the Adventist conference. And so there was this expectation that, um, you know, you're baptized, you're educated in the system, you, and then you uh, work for the system. And it's, it's really just, it is set up systematically um, for you to just stay in that um, bubble. Yeah, and the snake's and, just kind of eating its tail. Yeah, and there's there's consequences um, if you if you don't. I mean, it, it really was not not a lot of option there, and um, you know, it, it is a male driven society, and so I, I know stories of women who were in terrible marriages, abusive marriages, um, couldn't leave because if they were to get a divorce, which is, you know, frowned upon um, in the church, um, they, they'd lose benefits, maybe even their job. And so um, it, it's tied so closely to your economic wealth and your, your financial stability, the staying within the church, working within the church, and then even not even being able to leave a you know abusive relationship. So I, I've seen it. Um, uh, basically, it's it's a net <laughs> over your whole life. If That's I can just, just dirty. If I can just comment on that though, an interesting uh, observation though is, is, and one thing I guess I do have to give credit to the Adventist Church for at least, <laughs> um, at least the Adventist Church appears to be somewhat of an economic driver and. Uh, supporter for the Adventist communities that they serve, unlike what I saw with the black churches. I, I n- have never, uh, and, 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 not, and not saying that it doesn't exist, but I never experienced or witnessed um, the black churches really being economic engines for the black communities. What I did see uh, w- were a lot of black churches actually um, taking advantage and to this day taking advantage of poor people in black communities with respect to um, this whole gimmick I call it of prosperity preaching and the fact that so many folks in those communities are giving way more than um, they can afford to give to the churches and church causes and in return are getting very little to nothing so at least the Adventist church it are, are providing resources that turn into income <laughs> for 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 their their church members. Sometimes, oh, no, no doubt, though <laughs> that pros- prosperity gospel is probably the most evil thing out there. Oh man, it's, yeah, and I I can't say that the Adventist Church does that as well for black churches in the U.S. <laughs> uh, the black churches very much have a, a second class status within the the denomination. Mm. Yeah, and I know there's some parts of the world where yeah they. They r- raise people up out of poverty to their own detriment. Uh, like uh, Korea is a great example of, of that, where first generation, the person is very devout. Second generation, they give their all to the church. Third generation, they're affluent, well educated, and out the door. Mm. Mm. Interesting. But that first generation was in abject poverty. Yep. And for, you know, to be able to make that transition in three years is pretty astounding. Yeah. Or excuse me, three generations. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree with you. Yeah, and I always give the disclaimer that you know I, 
I actually had a wonderful childhood, and um, I don't know about your uh, high school experience, Dustin, but, you know, Milo um, was a a golden time for me. I I enjoyed um, my boarding school experience, my Adventist education from first grade all the way through, you know, four-year university, Um, and there is an emphasis on education. It might be um, in conjunction with the emphasis that Indian people have on education. So I kind of got a double whammy there. But um, I did, I, I, I do give that disclaimer because, you know, I was able to have um, a private education, um, really great opportunities from music and um you know, activities and ski trips and and things that just, I guess, are um, part of my memories growing up um, in the Pacific Northwest in a private education um, environment. And so to me, you know, being in that bubble, it it felt fine. It wasn't traumatic. Um, It was just getting to adulthood and getting to a place where I could step back from the bubble and think critically and ask myself some questions, I was able to say, you know what, this stuff doesn't make sense to me anymore. This stuff doesn't fit intellectually for me anymore. Um, But I do give that disclaimer because I really, um, I'm sure a lot of people have had more traumatic experiences with, um, you know, fundamental uh, Christianity or whatever brand of religion they grew up in. It wasn't the case for me. Um, I, I can say that I'm grateful for what felt like a very normal and healthy um, childhood. Well, for and Jamila, I'm curious, does uh-huh. Seventh Day, uh, do they have any subjects in school that are like taboo or majors that are frowned upon in education? Um, not that not that I'm aware of. I went to, you know, Walla Walla um, University in Washington State, which uh, tends to be a little more liberal. Um, than some of the other Adventist universities. Um, so Which made it a bit harder have... for me to get a job afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So we kind of had the full gamut of a liberal arts college, but um, mm. you know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know if your question was uh, maybe implying that maybe more scientific or technical majors would tend to drive people away from the church, but I can tell you. I'm like living proof that I work with nothing but scientists and engineers, and this seems to play no role whatsoever in mm-hmm. people's ability to still subscribe to yep. religious uh, beliefs. Yeah. Oh, and Walla Walla's <laughs> biggest program was engineering. Exactly. Oh, okay. Exactly. See, yeah. I'm telling you, religious engineers, I'm telling you. <laughs> uh, they also had but, a lot of, of science majors, most of whom were, gonna, were planning on being doctors. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but how many of them were like geologists or? Uh, uh, I yeah. don't think there was a geology major. Exactly. exactly. There was biology, but that was for med school. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but no, my, my point was more like, uh, say, uh, uh, Christian scientists where they don't want to have like us, like I was just uh, pointing towards like a uh, geology or right. like h- hard sciences that, you know, I'm, definitely frowned upon. I'm not aware of if there's any like taboo majors, but, you know, growing up in um, Adventist elementary school and of course middle school you, you get the um, you get the science videos where they tell you all right ignore the reference to billions and billions of years and I know there's a family guy clip and you know they dub it out and say hundreds and hundreds of years and so it's you just kind of got uh, you got accustomed to um, just ignoring the things they said to ignore about real science. Now, I, I don't know if, uh, you know, I, I can't say this based off of any data that I've collected, but um, I, I bet there is a correlation though, between certain certain majors. I would say, like you talked about geology, maybe anthropology and maybe physics. And uh, I, I think you tend to see, I do know a lot of physicists and many of them are, are atheists. Um, uh, I don't know many geologists. I know a couple, and I don't really know what their uh, religious beliefs are. Uh, but I think there may be some correlation between particular majors. There's some things, there's some some fields of study, some bodies of knowledge that once you acquire them, it is just impossible to deny 
that Anthro- anthropology is non-existent in the Adventist educational system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Physics departments tend to be very tiny. They mostly exist, like a, a, at least in the case of Walla Walla, they exist for people who want to take astronomy for their their science credit for their generals or for engineering majors who need a couple of physics classes. Mm-hmm. That's what the department was there for. They just happened to have a few people that actually be crazy enough to sign up for it. <laughs> how many how many disciplines are biology related though in at Walla Walla? Biology. Mm. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but it, it's the so one it doesn't major. get past it doesn't really get past that though. They're like, uh, more specialized. Uh, th- there's a, a marine biology master's program. Okay, but well that's still dealing with pretty much current yep. uh, living things, not yeah. prehistoric. I okay. do know that they do teach the scientific facts of evolution in some of the early biology classes. Because uh-huh. I, I remember you saying that uh, their evolution uh, evolution books, the stuff they had on evolution was like really outdated, but they still kind of had it. Now, that was for my class in the seminary, uh, Issues and Origins. Ah. And so that was specifically geared for pastors. Yeah, you started down the, the, the road to pastordom. Uh-huh. <laughs> if you like this show, consider giving us some financial support. To make it really easy with one-time donations or to support us on a per-episode, monthly, or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon, Find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. One dollar an episode is all we ask. Please, think of the kittens. Going back a little bit to what you are saying about, you know, what, what our educations were like there. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, for me, it was, you know, academically, it was fine. Uh, it was socially that I had trouble because, and it was just the fact that I was in third grade, I was the weird new kid from Eastern Oregon at Mm -hmm. a tiny little school and I got bullied and then I was just the kid that everybody bullied. So by the time I got to Milo, I didn't know how to make friends. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very lonely experience for me, just like, well, the rest of my childhood. Right. But it wasn't the school's fault, at least not Milo's fault. Uh, But then, uh, one thing that was definitely interesting was out of our graduating class of uh, 65 people, mm-hmm. I think there was only three that didn't at least start college. Yeah. I mean, the the emphasis to graduate and move on to, um, you know, undergrad and beyond was was definitely there. It, 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 it's, again, it's just ingrained that... Um, Education is, you know, you just, you don't just, you're not just satisfied with the, with the high school diploma. So, um, that, that's a pretty good percentage, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think the stats are something like half of Adventist high school age, uh, you know, members or children of members do attend yeah. Adventist academies. And the vast majority of people who attend Adventist academies do go on to, college whether it's an, and about half of them go to on or better um mm-hmm. do go on to adventist colleges if then mm-hmm. the rest usually to community college well there's kind of a um stigma if you don't go to an adventist school mm-hmm. um there's a there's a big judgment um put on parents who send their kids to public school i i saw it um you know in my family and acquaintances and and there's just this Either there's this judgment of, oh, you couldn't afford it, or, oh, um, you're not religious enough. You're going to allow your kids to be influenced by, you know, public school kids and public school teachers. And so either way, um, you know, it, it, it is very much encouraged, if not required, that you do whatever it takes to send your kids to Adventist schools. Yeah. So with, with so many, you know, uh, that's an interesting statistic that you brought up about the number of uh, people who attend Adventist academies and kind of their progression through the education system. You know, that would lead me to want to believe that at some point, uh, like you mentioned about Korea, you know, at some point um, the Adventist Adventist church would kind of implode on itself with people uh, getting more and more educated. But 
I don't really see that happening either. In fact, it sounds like the Adventist church may be growing. Uh, and I don't know if that's propaganda that I may have heard from the church or uh, if, if that is if that is true. Uh, so I guess the que- maybe I have a question just to kind of throw out here because that, that's interesting. Me, uh, interesting to me is is there as much of a correlation between education and one's um, questioning of their religious beliefs, or is there something else there that pushes a person uh, to start to question their beliefs and maybe even leave leave uh, church altogether? I would definitely say both. Uh, in my case, I was just the annoying little kid at like six or so, asking how did all the creatures fit on Noah's Ark, and getting <laughs> getting kicked out of Bible school, Sunday school, and I got to sit with the adults. Um, but you know, I I was calling myself an atheist to myself when I was about thirteen, so <laughs> wasn't so much education on my part at that time. But uh, definitely the uh, the more education a person gets in general, I'd say the less likely they are to be a believer. Yeah, and the Adventist Church does a good job of trying to inoculate their their children from reality. There mm. was the, the middle school science texts were from the general conference and I think like half of eighth grade science was creationist propaganda. Mm. For sure. In my biology class uh, for high school, I was at my junior academy, we just straight up skipped the chapter on evolution. Wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> it, we had to use the state mandated textbook because that is the state of Oregon. But yeah, we just skipped chapter four and the teacher piled <laughs> on extra homework for chapter five to make sure we wouldn't have time to go back. Mm. And when you're getting it every week at church and every day, you know, five days a week at school, the propaganda is effective. For sure. Until kids get out of college. The stat I remember hearing was that half, this was like right before, uh, before graduation, they were saying, you know, half of you will graduate and never again step foot in Adventist church. Mm. I'm fine with that. (laughs) And I would suspect that's underestimating it. I think like um, the indoctrination is strong. Um, It it starts very young. Um, It's encouraged. And I I mean, I have a whole, I blog about all sorts of things that I find to be um, (laughs) dangerous and harmful uh, when it comes to religious indoctrination. But, um, you know, the, your mind cannot critically think at that young age. um, And you're, you're giving them ideas and concepts about afterlife and hell. And, you know, these are you know, they're basically just regurgitating whatever their elders are going to tell them to do. And we take it as, oh, this young person has given their life to Jesus. And, um, you know, we're we're so excited about uh, young people getting baptized. And, I mean, a 10-year-old uh, getting baptized, I mean, they, they have not... Um, fully formed critical thoughts and even the process of how to decide for themselves if this is something they want or not. Um, I know as a child, um, you know, I'm not going to question what my parents tell me. I don't know how to do that. And I'm, I'm not trained to do that. I'm trained to take whatever they say at face value. And so, um, you know, I just, I have a lot of objections to indoctrination of children. Um, but that indoctrination, especially in the Adventist church, starts so early. And it is a culture. It's not just a religion. It is a total lifestyle and culture. And um, the social science behind it of, of wanting to belong, of not wanting to leave the, the herd, um, that's all a big part of, I think, why there's so many um, closet atheists in general. Um, you know, I think from some of my blogging that I've done, and I've done a series on life after Adventism. And I've got a lot of people who've commented um, anonymously or whatnot and have the similar feelings. But again, it's that uh, fear to come out publicly. And so um, that, in, like I said, that indoctrination is strong and that need to belong to 
a tribe um, often keeps people from vocalizing their their truth and ever um, coming out of the closet. And so there's a lot of people with private thoughts and private doubts, but we just don't have a culture um, that allows them to safely feel accepted outside the bubble. And there's parts of that culture that will never leave you. Mm-hmm. I have introduced my wife to haystacks and she <laughs> I've likes them. My husband to big Franks. <laughs> I have a can of linkettes in the, the cupboard. Um, Lauren does not like them. <laughs> okay. You guys have to kind of share. Well, what are you talking about? <laughs> haystacks are basically a taco salad that you build yourself right before okay. you eat it. And yes. so it's really good for potlucks or, or big meals. Um, because you can have people bring in. I've actually did this for a bunch of atheist friends coming over for a Super Bowl party. We mm-hmm. did haystacks, and I assigned people an item to bring <laughs> and let them be creative. So I had a pulled pork haystack. <laughs> oh, it my. was awesome. Nothing Adventist about that. Uh, nope. <laughs> <laughs> and the Sorry. Big Franks and Linkettes are uh, vegetarian hot dogs. Wait, well, what? <laughs> yeah. It- <laughs> It's hard. It's like a. It's like a. It's like a software glitch. It's hard to process that a vegetarian hot dog. Like seriously, it is hot dog shaped compressed vegetable <laughs> protein. <laughs> okay, but here's the interesting thing about it. It's freaking delicious, man. Like, <laughs> are we talking about like tofurkey kind of oh. stuff? Oh, so much better than tofurkey. Just like yeah. fake meat. Fake meat. You fry up a big frank with some like scrambled eggs and rice, and man, I'm telling you, <laughs> you you've got a party. And big, big Franks and Linkettes, the big difference is the, the Big Franks are a little bit bigger and have a tangier taste to them. Tangy, right. Okay. Which, from <laughs> what my, my uncle has told me about stuff he delivered to uh, Loma Linda Foods, some uh, produce deliveries, they accepted all of it, and a decent amount of it was rotten. <laughs> Ooh. So my guess would kind of be that the, the rotten stuff goes into the, the Big Franks to, to help add that tanginess, <laughs> and the, the Linkettes get the fresher stuff. Don't tell me that. <laughs> but Wesley, Adventists yeah. have a whole um, a whole line of food products um, that that would blow your mind if you ever went to uh, Apple Valley in in Berrien Springs, Michigan. Mm. That's a bold claim, man. <laughs> So it is it is a culture that goes way past religion. It's it's a lifestyle and um, a lot of good things about it and a lot of uh, not so great things about it. But um, it is it's it's like you never have to leave. You have um, from recreational activities to what you eat to what you wear. It's it is taught from, you know, from the from the crib. Hmm. So yeah, I was raised eating everything from like pickled pig's feet to <laughs> make my own homemade spaghetti. I don't know. Just everything. Oh, yeah. What's that? I, I said, oh yeah, pickled pig's feet, man. That's a... Oh yeah, I'll suck on a knuckle all day. <laughs> <laughs> oh. that, that's also been freeing because um, now that I'm not restricted by Leviticus, um, <laughs> I have... <laughs> enjoyed uh fried shrimp and Mm. all sorts of um restricted foods um you know i don't i don't have to ask if the fish has scales or if the um animal chews its cud before i can partake and so um the culinary palate has been opened up for sure oh yeah (laughs) so so what are your thoughts on bacon oh um Definitely amazing food <laughs> product. Um, I, like I said, that indoctrination is deep and it's really hard still for me to eat pork. However, um, like I'll order potato soup and it'll have the bacon, real bacon chunks on the top. And I have no problem <laughs> mixing that in and, and eating it up. Whereas before I'd be <laughs> like, ooh, take that back. Um, and, and it is a little guilty pleasure. I, I have to say, I understand the, the love affair with bacon now. You know, I have to say, I think bacon is an underutilized 
propaganda to had the Adventist church just claim that God created bacon, they would have had a lot more believers because they would they would have converted me right there. I, I could believe that. That's how I feel about bacon. <laughs> I, I get it now. Yeah, um, definitely. I definitely understand its power. <laughs> And for the, the two of you with the Adventist, Baptist, African American, and Indian <laughs> cultures, it's got to be some great food up. In all there. being merged into one house. Uh, how, how's that working out? Awesome. Yeah, like like you said, din- meal time is amazing. <laughs> uh, uh, some good some good food going on in here, but um, yeah, there's some cultural, um, you know, so. Between it's funny because like between between Jamila and I, there were like no cultural barriers. It, it, was, it was it was strange how like we didn't see. I don't even know if we really looked at each other as being like of different races. Labeled or like, but between the families, there's definitely a noticeable difference. You know, from you have the conservative Adventist Indian home and the. South Side of Chicago Baptist home, and there, there were some, you know, there's some interesting dynamics that played there. But uh, you know, our families don't really cross paths too often, um, so. Yeah, we're all kind of spread out: Oregon, Chicago, and Al- yeah, Huntsville, Alabama. But um, we, yeah, we're kind of um, labelless, and and that's just part of who we are and our authenticity. It's it's just we both. Um, I think we both seek out otherness, and so we're very comfortable with um, learning new things and kind of uh, acclimating. And I feel like, you know, just I've acclimated my whole life. It's it's just you just go from environment to environment and, you know, growing up in a very, very, very small white town of Albany, Oregon, um, to... You know, a little more diverse in Washington State, where I went to college, and then moving to Huntsville, Alabama, where um, more more Black people than I've ever lived with or lived around. And then there's this huge Indian community. There's a pretty big Hispanic community, and so um, I've gone from you know kind of no no diversity to uh, quite a bit of diversity here, and. Um, for me, it's been it. It feels right. It, it's a good fit for me. I don't like necessarily um, places that are uh, afraid of otherness, and so this this feels right for me. And um, I guess you know, people say, "Oh, you guys are a interracial couple," or you know, totally different cultures. And um, it it I have to say it, we are oh, oh yeah I have to remind myself that we are I, I guess it's just Chris and Jamila it just it just works yeah it's strange how you just you kind of lose that and don't get me wrong I can't I can't, can't deny that that yes we come from two vastly different cultural backgrounds but I don't know it just doesn't feel that <clears throat> weird that yeah that strange now if you see me when I have to interact with her family during uh, family visits that's something. Uh, you probably love to record and get on, <laughs> get on your show. It's hilarious. Yeah. Well, you and know, I, I it's, met Jamila's it's, parents. <laughs> <laughs> then you know. Yes. And there weren't many words know. said. <laughs> no. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, there, there's a cultural difference between, like you said, the generations, you know, the first generation and the second generation. And that's, that's probably the, um, biggest difference, um, it's it's where you know where they grew up and got educated um overseas and whereas i grew up and got educated here in in the states i mean that's it's a huge difference and as far as what you can relate to and what you're accustomed to so the biggest difference is probably generational Hmm. all right i always thought it was supposed to be like really awkward when you're like around the, you know, the, the step parents though. <laughs> that's kind of a requirement. Yeah. There, there's plenty of that that works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It can be, it can be a little, a little awkward anyway, you know, just, uh, even if there wasn't a cultural difference there, it would probably, 
there's always some awkwardness there around in laws. Well, and one thing I've noticed with with Lauren is some of that awkwardness seems to be Adventist mm-hmm. because with her parents, <laughs> they're just our drinking buddies. Nice. We go wow. and visit, and her mom has beer that she's bought just for me to drink. That she's <laughs> excited to share with me and make right. sure I always have one in my hand. And we go see my parents, and um, they are very much the the adults, and we are the children. Yep. And it will wow. always be that way. <laughs> I think you're right, Dustin. I think that might be an um, definitely uh, Adventist awkwardness. Yeah, there was none of that going on here, though. And there, <laughs> the, this last visit from her parents, they opened... We have in our house, there's a, a little area that's a bar, but it has a door on it. And so when they first got here, they were exploring the house and they opened up that door and they saw like three bottles of tequila and a bottle of rum. And her mother turned to her and said, what, what did she say to you? Oh, I see where you keep your drinks. <laughs> <was> like, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, there was no, there was no pulling out the bottle of tequila and pouring around the shots for the family. That wasn't happening. So... <laughs> However, when Chris's dad visits, uh, he is a wine connoisseur. So there's, mm. you know, that's just the culture and and what we do when he visits. There's always a bottle of wine, and it's very much um, acceptable and 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 part of the dining experience. So it it is. It's just uh, night and day, I guess. Yeah, mm-hmm. we we dropped them off at church on Saturday morning while we were on our way to the gym. That felt kind of awkward because they really wanted us to be at church, but. I was in shorts with a with a towel around my neck, ready to go work out. But you know, no TV. We didn't really turn the TV on on Saturday, so there's some yeah, there's some awkwardness there that I think is purely Adventist. <laughs> Man, <laughs> going back to the culinary uh, mm-hmm. piece, mm-hmm. have you tried a yellow curry bacon cheeseburger? Oh my God! That sounds no. Weird. It is to die not for. Not yet, I should say. Not yet. <laughs> uh, a few weeks ago, uh, 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 Laura and I were hosting a, a barbecue. It was, okay, it was the weekend our wedding is originally scheduled for. We still uh-huh. have the reservation for the park, and uh, so we we had this you know potluck gathering for for friends, and someone brought it was uh, Thai curry actually, but mm-hmm. almost everybody took their burger and poured yellow curry on top of it, and it was amazing. I must try this. That sounds amazing, and it will be on the menu for next week. We'll have to send you an email. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and everybody listening, you must try this. <laughs> Make it happen. I'll, I'll try it, but I've never been too impressed with curries other than Japanese curry, so I'll I'll, I'll have oh, to try this. Oh, Wesley. Oh, uh, go go to a, a good Japanese restaurant and find some tonkatsu or some katsu That's curry. Totally. How okay. culturally uneducated I am. I didn't I, even know Japanese I didn't had know curry. Japanese had curry. It's a brown curry and it's so amazing. What's it called again? Uh just well, Japanese curry or like a, there's a pork cutlet that is uh lightly deep fried in panko breading, and they'll put a big side of rice and uh Japanese curry on it. And they just call it katsu curry katsu or tonkatsu. Okay. All right. Oh, I got spoiled. I, I was over there for about a year and a half and just love, love the place and the food. Yeah. yeah I would oh. say probably the best curry I've ever had. Jamila, I think your par- parents brought food is <laughs> either to Milo or for the international food festival at Walla Walla. Uh, both probably. Well, mostly Milo. Yeah. It was amazing. Yes. Yeah. And I was pretty lucky <laughs> growing up. Very authentic. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I've been I've been to Milo once. It seems like a pretty bland place to live. <laughs> you yeah, can the, the, he came for our ten year anniversary, and he was like, "This is a serial killer's paradise." <laughs> oh, oh, oh. It is in the middle of nowhere, and no cell phone reception. It's a, it's a little scary, right? So you went to the reunion. <laughs> I did. It was an experience. We had just gotten married <laughs> and in September, and the um, reunion was in October. And I was, like I said, I was excited to get back there. I had a pretty 
pretty good memories of the place. And so I was like, it's been 10 years. And I did. I really wanted to show Chris the, uh, this place I, I've described to him that you can't, you know, you have to go there to, to experience it and c- go across that covered bridge in the middle of Southern Oregon. And, uh, yeah, he was, he was freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> It is the opposite of Chicago, I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I skipped the reunion because I was looking... Well, for one, on the, the Facebook group we had going on right then, I wasn't seeming to get much traction with having an alternate reunion at, at Seven Feathers at the bar. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we do that Friday night during Vespers and then sleep off our hangovers before heading yeah. in after church. Yes. And the schedule is all church services. Oh, that's that's all it is. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, Vespers. Oh yeah. Friday night Do, church service. Yeah, oh, sure. Fine, Vespers. Yeah, like you do. We stayed at Seven Feathers, didn't we? We did. We stayed at Seven <laughs> Feathers Friday night. Um, and you won like fifty bucks on the. Uh, the <laughs> yeah. I wish. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah, one of those other things that I'm sure is frowned upon. Definitely. (laughs) Definitely. There's a long list, Wesley. There's a long list. (laughs) And and how much of the list applies depends on how conservative of a family you're from. Sure. I mean, Seventh Day can actually be, like, fairly vegetarian. Vegan on the extreme. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not happening here. Yeah. (laughs) And the vegan potlucks are terrifying. Oh, the good thing about Indian Adventists is they have delicious potlucks, and they're they're um, okay. A lot of them are okay with eating meat, and so mm. um, I did not have that super strict. I gr- I grew up eating meat as well as some of the veggie meat, so it all just kind of glom together but i do have several family members who um you know they don't do the the eggs or the dairy oh my. and um that's just no fun but if you're going to be a vegetarian you should make some indian friends because man some of the best dishes that i've ever had have been like vegetable curries They're amazing yeah you can survive a vegetarian lifestyle with some with some curry mm-hmm. see that sounds a lot better than like fake dogs <laughs> faux dogs yeah faux well, dogs. it's the difference between thousands of years of perfecting vegetarian cooking versus somebody trying to make a substitute <laughs> true so that you have something for barbecues true and barbecuing fake meat does not work well <laughs> oh man you could kebab anything <laughs> uh no linkettes big franks they they just burn. Mm-hmm. So you just have singe marks on the sides and they do get it. dry. <laughs> you want to tell them about fried chick curry and fried chick gongra? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I like it all, man. I can I can get down with some with some veggie meat. Yeah, her parents her parents make Indian curry out of the Loma Linda veggie meat. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Man, I haven't even thought of fried chick in a long time. <laughs> yeah, it just took you back then. <laughs> That taste that the the broth that it's in has. Yeah. Do they do anything with that? Oh yeah, they dr- that they that's the juice, man. That's the gravy. Oh. <laughs> Fantastic, but huh. um, don't read the label. That's a lot of sodium. Oh for yeah. Some, yeah. For some health food. Yeah, it's it's the and to explain what fry check is for <laughs> everybody else, it is a. Uh, Attempt to sub, uh, to fake chicken, basically yeah. with weird. gluten, vegetable protein, and this weird pseudo chicken broth that's not quite chicken. Yeah, it's just really salty and has like a little tang to it. Mm-hmm. It's not even close to chicken. No, it's terribly deceiving. <laughs> it's one of the least accurate. <laughs> I would say the least accurate uh, fake meat. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, as soon as we're done with this call, I'm going to go into my kitchen and fry up a whole <laughs> bunch of hot cabbage, fried hot cabbage with some bacon in it. There you go. <laughs> oh. That sounds amazing. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah. Oh. It's been a while. <laughs> I had bacon this morning. You guys mm-hmm. and your weird foods. There's there's a lot of weird things, man. Stripples. Stripples. <laughs> what the fuck? You're making shit up now. Come on. Nope. <laughs> it's a, a uh, substitute bacon. Oh hell no! That Terrible. doesn't even sound like fake bacon. Which is actually more uh, more accurately, it'd be substitute turkey bacon. Yeah. Yeah. Oh hell no! He's not making it up, man. I'm telling you. I used what? to love that stuff. <laughs> What about a wham sandwich? <laughs> <laughs> so you're, you're, but you're actually, I'm still trying exactly. to wrap my mind around this. You're, exactly. you're talking about like fake, fake fake tur- uh, uh, yeah. turkey bacon. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So even less flavor than turkey bacon. Oh, why, why wouldn't you just fake bacon instead of like faking turkey bacon? <laughs> well, you know, the, I, well, the reason I brought up turkey bacon is it's an attempt to replicate bacon, but <laughs> it's closer to turkey bacon than it actually is pork bacon. Yeah. Oh, all right. Because, you know, turkey bacon doesn't have anywhere near as much flavor and stripples <laughs> don't have much flavor. <laughs> And they have a very fake um, bacon design, uh-huh. <laughs> is what I would probably describe it as. Yeah. A lot of food coloring. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I still yeah. think you're making shit up. Mm-mm. <laughs> nope. Look up Loma Linda Foods. Now owned by Kellogg. <laughs> mm-hmm. All of the Aventus foods are now owned by Kellogg. Awesome. Wow. Except for Little Debbie's. Awesome. McKee Bakery. If you ever, if you ever just want to entertain yourself, like some some good old fashioned humor, <clears throat> just go to like the Loma Linda section in your local grocer and just read all of the different names. They're not going to have. They may not have that section in in Seattle. Really? Really? Wait, you said Little Debbie? No, Loma Linda Foods, the the oh. vegetarian food section. We're yeah. Huntsville kind of has a large Adventist population. Oakwood University is here. Right, right. Yeah. So it's not uncommon to find these products in a grocery store. However, um, in most cities, you're not going to find it at Walmart like we do. Mm. You we will can go find to, uh, Morningstar Farms. Yes, you'll find other veggie and- brands. Morningstar Farm was the Loma Linda brand for general consumption. Got it. Huh. Now also just owned by Kellogg. Yeah, no. <laughs> Seattle is is hipster enough, well, is like ahead of the hipsters. So if it's vegetarian, it's going to be like straight organic and, you know, weird gluten non-GMO free. stuff. And yeah, well, we don't. It's not gluten free, that's for sure. <laughs> it's extra gluten. It is packed full of gluten. <laughs> oh, going back to the the, the Adventist uh, vegan potluck I went to. Oh, oh no. it this was in college. I was uh, you know having to sign up for for preaching gigs and quickly found out the secret that you can make money on Sabbath doing that. <laughs> uh, they'd pay you the the mileage they'd pay was about double what it cost me in gas. It was still less <laughs> than the IRS recommended mileage, <laughs> but. So, so what I did, started doing was try to sign up for the f- most distant one possible. <laughs> <laughs> and so what I did was, I think it was north of I-90. Mm. And so it was like a three-hour drive to get there. And I got there, and I was just, my, my food allergy issues had just bumped up a notch again beyond just a couple of fruits to I wasn't quite sure what I could eat. And mm-hmm. I was at this potluck, and everything was vegan. It was all casseroles. They all had large quantities of gluten. Oh. And they all had nuts, too. The most creative ways of making some kind of nut cheese. <laughs> A lot of cashew 
kind of yeah. not really even close to cheese. Um, <laughs> a lot of uh, almond, some peanut. Oh man, it was crazy. And of course, by the end, I had to take a Benadryl <laughs> and drive three hours back to campus. Oh, ouch. Yeah. It was terrifying. <laughs> Potlucks are scary to begin with, so I can imagine a vegan one. Yeah, when you're a 20 year old <laughs> male in college, Eating potlucks anything. are amazing. They want you to eat more and more and more. Take leftovers. And there's usually some casserole that has just enough salt and cheese to be good. <laughs> True. Oh, uh, you guys are funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was not my life growing up, but um, when I first started dating Jamila, she was still kind of kind of adventist, so <clears throat> I was fortunate enough to get an inside, <laughs> an inside view, a sneak peek at what it was like, and um, and he didn't run away. No, ah. I went to church and everything with her. Like she was so pretty, I didn't care. I was like, hey, this is <laughs> this is what I got to do. You know, <laughs> Sabbath school it is. Sabbath school. Oh. <laughs> All right, I think we are out of time. Uh, so, uh, what do you guys have to plug? Well, um, I have been blogging for a little while, and that's that's my um, weapon of choice, I guess. Um, but Chris and I are committed now to um, a podcast that we've been um, planning for some time now called Real Talk with the Randalls, and we're <laughs> going to address uh, religion, race, relationships and whatever else we feel like talking about so um look out for that i don't necessarily have a target audience but i have found that um people who are um seeking uh leaving adventism uh who are maybe already unsubscribed but just need some extra support um i find those people um to be very interested in some of the thoughts that i share and so i've i've connected a lot with with that demographic and um so my my um series on life after adventism which is on my blog jamillamrandall.com has um has proven to be pretty um effective and i hope to continue uh with the series there on my blog sweet very nice and yeah once you get the uh that first episode of your podcast out um send me a link to the uh, website you have for it and uh, we'll let our listeners know will do appreciate it all right well thank you both very much for joining us it's been a real pleasure thank yeah, you, you guys are all right thank you for having us look forward to chatting soon awesome for our listeners, we will be back next week with news. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find us online at www.atheistnomads.com. Contact us at contact at atheistnomads.com or leave us a voicemail message at 541-203-0666. You can also like us on Facebook or leave us a review on iTunes, Zoom, or wherever else you find the podcast. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomad.